Good afternoon, everyone. Is everyone cold? Yeah, it's freezing out there, isn't it? So um, I thought what I'd start to do is ask each of you to introduce yourselves. But in the context of your introduction, tell me how old your accelerator is, how many startups you've put through your program since inception, mm -hmm. and then also the length of the program and how often you do it. Um, and if you can, just to give you know, everyone a really good education, if you're able to tell a little bit about what kind of stakes you take in the companies as well. Okay. Yeah. So, Craig, let's Should start I go with first? You. Yeah. Hey, guys. Um, I'm going to try and remember all of those points, and <laughs> if I forget one, let me know. Uh, so, hi, I'm Craig, uh, Director of Marketing at YC, uh, Y Combinator. We've been around for 10 years now, 1,400-plus um, companies, uh, total market cap of $85 billion. Uh, we run two three-month programs every year, so winter and summer batches. Uh, what were the other points? Stakes that you take. In oh, the yeah, programs. 7% for 120K. Um, and then we have pro rata rights for uh, future rounds. And uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Jennifer. Hi, I'm Jennifer Cabala. I'm the VP of Startup Programs for Techstars. Techstars has been around for 10 years also, um, starting in Boulder, Colorado, but now we are in over seven countries around the world. We run about 30 programs a year in various places. Um, we have had over 1,000 companies um, go through our program. Uh, our total market cap for ventures and our accelerators is $64 billion. Um, we also run a bunch of other programs as well, Startup Weekend, which a lot of people are familiar with. We run in 160 countries around the world, Startup Week and Startup Digest as well. Um, and what was the other question? Stakes that you take in the companies. Um, yes, so we take around 7% or so um, for 120K. Um, but we really look at it as you're investing in the, the entire company through all of the services that you provide as well. I'm sure the other people on the panel would kind of agree with that, but it's not a, it's not a valuation event. Great. Yeah. And last but not least, Thomas. Yeah, hi guys, I'm Thomas Korte. I'm the founder of AngelPad. AngelPad, uh, we launched AngelPad in 2010, so we've been around um, almost eight years now. Um, it was actually, you know, the three, those guys started, and then Techstars uh, was soon after, and we're the third accelerator in the US, the first one in San Francisco. Um, since then, we've done 130 startups, so we're very, very, very boutique and small. We do two cohorts a year, uh, where we choose about 12 companies to work with each time. We invest, uh, or, you know, combined valuations, all that. Uh, we've, uh, our companies have raised an aggregate of about $800 million to date. Um, and uh, what's the other question? Oh, equity. So we take 7% uh, in common stock for about $120,000. And then we have select follow-ons um, as the companies, as the company continue to grow. Okay, great. So, wow, the Premier League of accelerators on this uh, stage. So sort of next question. Um, accelerators in the last three to five years have really become a household name. So I think everybody and their dog is definitely doing an accelerator. But, you know, you three are the original. And what do you need to do now in order to attract the best companies to your accelerator? What, what is your offering? What is the value that you're giving to these companies in comparison to some of your other accelerators that you see? Well, I think for us that when we started, we were really about being in one community in Boulder, Colorado, and bringing great mentors around that. But I think as we've grown, we realized that we need to be a worldwide network that helps entrepreneurs succeed. And that's what we've gone for by providing services for the entire life cycle of an entrepreneur, starting at something like Startup Weekend all the way up to Series A, B, C. So we, we really see it as providing services around um, business development, helping them match up with other big corporations because we know it takes a really long time for companies to sell to big enterprises. We also have a full-time corp dev team that just helps companies that are looking to get acquired or find another great partner. We have alumni services as well. And then we also have investor services for companies that are looking to raise their Series A. And just recently we found out that one in 20 companies in the United States that raised a Series A was a Techstars company. So we really just looked at helping them from the very beginning all the way to the end of their right, life cycle. So from cradle to success or from cradle to grave, whatever <laughs> might, might Hopefully be. Hopefully not grave, but yes. <laughs> what about Y Combinator? Um, I think probably the biggest shift in the past few years has been um, how important the alumni network has gotten. I think that's really where we're seeing like compounding gains uh, because, yeah, our number one referral source for accepted YC companies, uh, it's alumni. And, and certainly, you know, living in London, we do see a lot of YC alumni yeah. really helping and trying to propel the startup ecosystem forward there. 
angel pad. Yeah, so Thomas. You know, we, we really have a very singular focus, um, and that's also the reason why we have so few companies in each cohort. You know, I see my role as getting the companies of AngelBed funded through the seed round. Um, you know, the kind of companies we built, all of us, I believe, um, are venture-backed companies that, that can potentially yield very, very large outcomes. And to do that, you need to raise money. And, uh, and uh, you know, for, to get from idea to prototype to seed round, successful, you know, million, two, two and a half, three million dollar seed round, that's what my focus is. So everything we do um, is, is focused around that, um, finding the right business. And that honestly is the reason why we have not changed our model, you know, through the past eight years. We stay very focused on a very small set of companies that is, that is highly selected from a very large pool of applicants and just work with them every day on everything they need to, uh, um, to get done through the seed round to then have, you know, yield these larger outcomes. And one quick thing, if the sound can turn on these speakers, it would help us to hear ourselves, please. <laughs> yeah, that's a great comment. Thank you. Um, so we were back there chatting away, and you know, one of the things I was mentioning is that we have a proliferation of accelerators around the world, literally hundreds and hundreds around Europe in every single nation. You know, one of my personal favorites in the UK is with the GCHQ. So it's the spies helping cybersecurity startups. Cool. And it's crazy, we did go to the donut in Cheltenham and um, we weren't allowed to know their names, we just got their first name. <laughs> and we weren't allowed to take their photos or else you know, we, won't, we didn't know what the spies would do to us. <laughs> so with that, there's a lot of noise out there. And I'd love you to give a word of advice to the startups in the audience who are looking to join an accelerator. What should they look for when trying to join? Obviously. <laughs> You three are the top. <laughs> I know you've got programs in Europe, um, but what should they be looking for? Give, them, give the gang out here some advice. So, Craig, let's start uh, with you. Yeah, referrals. I think that's the number one thing. Like, um, you can see their advisor network, you can see the companies they've invested in, but at the end of the day, just like an investor, a referral from someone you trust is the best thing. Okay. Jennifer, what do you I think? Would, I would totally agree with that. We encourage anybody to apply to talk to any one of our portfolio companies to see if it's a good fit for them. I think, though, to your point, there are places that are uh, accelerators that are proliferating around the world. And for some startups, they may not want to leave their their place where they're living, and so they may only want to focus on certain accelerators or ones in certain niches. And so if you're looking at something that maybe doesn't have as long of a track record, I think knowing what you want to get out of the program, interviewing people that have been a part of the program, and then going into the program with a plan and making sure that you feel that the people on that team can help you achieve the goals that you have. Okay. Thomas? I, I think that the first thing you should ask yourself when you start a company is, um, do you actually want to go into an accelerator? Um, because Let's face it, you're giving up an enormous part of your company um, you know, very early on. I know 7% doesn't sound that much, but over time, um, you, know, you might cry if you don't get the value out of it that you think you will. So I think evaluate first if you want to do it. The vast majority of founders that we end up accepting are people that, that start out with like, I, I don't need an accelerator. Like this is, you know, this is, I don't need training wheels. And then realize the value they, that an accelerator, that, that AngelPad can provide. And mostly they find out about that value from other people that have gone through our program and then apply. So I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing is geographic location. You know, if you want to build a company um, that is focused on Europe or on Germany or on something, you know, don't come to, to the US and kind of get the US mindset and then go back just because it was cool to hang out in Silicon Valley for, for three months. Um, I think on the vertical side, same thing. If you do vertical, you know, evaluate you know, do you associate yourself with a vertical particularly, which, you know, generally makes sense, um, or do you want to go horizontal? And also, you know, if it's a specific partner, like if it's a corporate accelerator, as you mentioned, you know, make sure that, you know, in that context, it is a company that is, that is a very large, very reputable company, and you're not becoming a development shop necessarily for that company that runs the accelerator just because they gave you $50,000. At the end, you want to build a, a large venture-backed company, and as you look into the next round of funding and investors look at that, um, they'll be asking you, like, you know, why did you do this? Like, why did you build this? Was it because X, Y, and Z company said this is a need for us, or was it because you had the aim to build a really, really large company? Great. So I think that's really great advice. There are some times that you shouldn't join an accelerator. And so it really is about making them really think long and hard about it. It's a conscious decision. It's, yeah. it's like a co-founder. It's like a minority co-founder, you know? And, 
as 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 seriously as you should take on a co as seriously as you should think about taking on a co-founder. Um, that's how you should think about an accelerator too. Do I want them on my cap table for the rest of time, um, and and giving a, a significant portion of of your equity? And so, you know, given that there's 2,000 some odd accelerators, um, do your homework. You know, it's not because you get into an accelerator um, that you are that you will be successful. And I, you know. Right now, if you are a founder and you, you know, it's you and your co-founder, maybe you're alone, and it seems like amazing validation to get into an accelerator, even if it's a, a bottom tier or mid-tier accelerator, um, you can only really go to one accelerator. We, we generally don't accept people that have gone through other accelerators just because the equity structure and the cap table becomes so complicated, and because we feel someone that has made a poor decision so early in the company might make more poor decisions down the road. So really, really evaluate um, you know, the people that that you're going to have uh, on your cap table as an accelerator, as, as investors that come in, um, and as employees or co-founders as well. Great. So each of you have, over the last eight to 10 years, worked with thousands of startups. And um, for sort of first question around that, because so you've got some really good pattern recognition going on, and you're sitting on some amazing amounts of data. So what have you learned since you've launched each of your accelerators what, what are some of the commonalities of the best way to build and grow a startup? Some really good basic one-on-one advice to some of the folks in the audience. Let's start with Y Combinator. You've, you've done a lot of great insight and mm -hmm. sharing, and you know all of us read the blog. So. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, um, so I think probably one of the unique insights that isn't widely talked about is that a lot of the big YC companies didn't pivot their way into this massive entity. A lot of them came into YC with the exact idea that they built. Uh, Airbnb, Dropbox, Stripe all came into YC knowing that. So I think having a unique insight and <coughs> conviction around that is really important. Um, I think a lot of startups tend to like pivot their way towards this like local maximum of just like fine. And um, that's cool if you want to do that. But uh, if your goal is to build this gigantic company, I think you, ha you have to have a unique insight. And so I think part of that is um, being really technical. And part of that is having someone who knows product. So it's the focus and drive to execute that, that's really key. Yeah, I, I think kind of like being agnostic to like whatever your company turns into is, is not good. Okay. Jennifer, what have you seen? Yeah, I would agree. Because you, you're probably well, the most global out there in terms <laughs> of tech stars. So yeah. what have you guys seen? But I think, to Craig's point, like I think you see people who feel like they're born to do it. And I, I don't want to say that entrepreneurs are born, because I think they are, are made. I think when you say that you're born, then it makes it sound like only certain people can be entrepreneurs, and I don't think that's true. But I think you have to have a, a conviction around something, right? I think you, you have to have a love for a piece of that business that you just can't be shaken away from. And I think some of our most successful companies very, very early on showed that love, and even if they changed some, there was a core piece of that that they felt like if they didn't do that business, like there was something wrong with the world, it just had to exist. Okay. So. What are your insights? So I'm, going to be, I'm going to be a lot less romantic about this than you guys are. I think it's all true what they say, 100% conviction, um, technical guts, all this stuff. What we've seen as, as one of the core, core success factors is focus. Um, as a startup founder, there's just a gazillion things you can do. Um, we all procrastinate, we all start to do the things that we like to do first and the things we don't like to do last. As a founder, there's no external pressure from anybody, no boss, no parent, nothing. Um, so for you to focus and just do uh, the things that you need to do, make decisions quickly, move on, uh, and really focus on your next round of funding. I mean, this is, you know, we all build venture-backed companies. We all talk about the value of our companies and the billions that they are worth and uh, the millions that they've raised. Um, you know, your goal as a, as a founder, your, your job as a founder, is to get to the next round of funding. If you're validated through the next round of funding, you have done all the right things, because the next round of funding, those people will evaluate you, who you've hired, what you've built, you know, what traction you've gotten to. Um, so as long as you continue to get to the next round of funding, you don't always have to take it, right? But you know, the best times is when people want to offer you money and you can say no, no to that. But it's just a singular focus on doing the things that matter to move the company forward. One last sentence. As you build a venture-backed startup, it is not like building a real company um, you know, like you, you see being built around you. You, know, you, are, you are building ahead of what the expectation is. So you, you really need to uh, 
just prove very few things to the next round of funding um, you know, to then continue on. It's very different from building an, an architect studio where you build you know, one day at a time and grow slowly over time to become big. You know, we expect you to go like this and eventually just explode. And for that, you just have to be very micro-focused on what has to be done every day um, to the next round of funding. Yeah, and I would just tack on to that, that it, it is very important to figure out the metric that's actually going to build a valuable company and not something that's going to just totally distract you. And also recognize uh, if that metric is actually creating value for you. A lot of the problems uh, yes. companies have, YC companies included, is that they uh, sell something that's worth a dollar for 80 cents. And uh, Paul Bukite says this all the time. Uh, your customers figure this out before you, and you just keep raising money, and then you die because you were just giving a discount and you're not actually selling the product for what it's worth. Okay, really good insights. So what three things do each of you look for when you're scouting for the companies? What, and, and be really, really just succinct. The three top criteria okay. that you choose on. Well, we are, ours are more than three, but it's team, 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 market traction idea. And we have team three times because it's that important, but it's also about whether they can execute, how do they get along as founders? Do they have good dynamics there? Of course, you want to make sure they're in a big market. And then are they showing some sort of traction? That doesn't mean that they have to have revenue or whatever, but it's like, are they making progress? Traction is just another word for, for yeah, progress. Because my observation about tech stars in London is the companies tend to be a lot later stage than I've seen in the tech stars programs in the US. So well, we're going to go about UK versus, or Europe versus US in a minute. Um, so go, Thomas, I, feel like I, yeah. I, I think you know, team, you will hear that from all of us, you know, the yeah. team that people make, you know, that is the key, key factor. Um, the other things that I look at um, specifically is, and that's really because I spent three months uh, with, with the founders uh, side by side, is it something that I'm personally excited about and I think I can add value to it as I work with them? And uh, the part that is probably um, less obvious is, uh, is it the right time to build this company? In other words, do I think this company can be funded within six to 12 months um, um, out of AngelPat? Uh, because again, you know, not to go on that we just live on venture capital because we do want to make money eventually, but you know, the, the first years is all about raising the next round of funding um, and hitting those, hitting those metrics. So can I get you funded in the next 12 months? Uh, because that's, that's my single stated goal. Okay. So last question, uh, and I'm sure people mob you after with questions um, after the panel, but um, we're in Europe, right? And t two of you are, you know, very mainly U.S. focused, and a lot of international startups come to your programs, but go back home. I know Techstars, you're in London, Paris, and Berlin mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. So uh, what are your observations about how it works over here versus in the U.S.? What, what are we doing right in Europe, or are we in a bubble? Or just just give me your thoughts. And I, I, I'm going to start with Y Combinator. Sure. Why have you never come to Europe? Um, we believe in focus. I, I, think okay. the, um, I think the thing that I didn't realize either when I moved to California from New York was that like, there's, there's a compounding benefit of being there. And it's, it's, everything's growing, but it's growing so fast that it's continually attracting this, these people and this talent. Um, so we believe in it. Uh, it's not to say it, it will never happen. Um, but we prefer to bring people over. Okay, what's your point of view about what you're seeing here? Uh, about the startups Just, uh, about, here, the venture uh, capital, or? Well, the, start, the, the accelerator ecosystem and some of the startups that you see coming from Europe. I think it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, because like YC would love to fund everyone in the world, but we can at this <laughs> point, so I think it's great. Okay, Thomas. So I'm generally super excited about European founders. Um, when, you, when you Google me and European founders, uh, you'll see some of my comments and videos um, or, 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 or chats I had like this. Um, we've had disproportional success with European founders. The founder of Postmates is from, uh, from Germany and the, and the other one from the UK. The founder of Vungle is from the UK, Rollpoint. And we really had a lot of companies that do well. I, I, it might be specific to people that leave Europe to go to the US. Um, so I haven't, I haven't seen that. We haven't many companies that have come back. Uh, Rollpoint is, is, is the only one for us. Um, you know, I think you know, when you build a company, you, you have to think about what you're going to do with this. There's three ways um, to, uh, to really make money of a company. One is you build a real business and you make money and you make lots and lots of money. Um, the second one is you sell your company to somebody. The third one is you go public, which is effectively selling it to the, corporate, uh, to the public markets and then continue running it. Um, whatever you build, you're going to have to figure out who's going to buy me, how am I going to make money, and what am I going to do with the company next. So when you are in a in a smaller market, you're going to have to look to a larger market. 
I think that now Europe certainly um, as a whole, but even individual countries within Europe, are at a scale where you can build very significant companies for one country. Um, I certainly think it's the same for a lot of, you know, you know the, 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 the Arab world, parts of Africa, certainly Brazil. Um, so if you are today, you know, in the UK or in Germany, you can build a company just for that market. If you are in Portugal, you might not be able to build a company just for that market. But I'm super excited about what's going on here and there's just, even just being at this conference, there's a very different vibe, there's a very different sense of design and style that's just very refreshing. <laughs> and I think it, you see that in, in startups as well. Okay, so very, very last point. Techstars has gone global. And we had a great discussion last night about what you were seeing um, with the European startups. Can you give me your very perspective? perspective yeah. very quickly. Yeah, I think we've seen the, the market here accelerate really quickly. In London, for example, we were seeing three years ago 10, 20% discounts in round size and valuation. That is fully caught up in, in, in the UK now, and we're seeing that as it's expanded, we've continued to accelerate over time. We're very bullish on Europe. That's why we keep opening programs here. I was looking, we've taken over uh, co companies from 23 different countries in Europe, and over 200 of our portfolio companies are European founders, so a lot of great stuff happening here. Okay, good. So there's hope for us here, gang. Um, and with that, thank there's you more so. There's more. more than than yeah, no, <laughs> That's great to see. It's a very positive um, feedback from all of you guys. So thank you very much for your time and your wonderful insights. And I'm sure if people have questions, they'd be happy to answer off time. Thanks, guys. Thank you.